Let's pray. May the God who came amongst us in Jesus and sent his Holy Spirit on the church be with us now as we gather round your word. Amen. One of my favourite podcasts is called The Rest is History. Twice a week, historians Tom Holland and Dominic Sandbrook take a theme, an event, a person from history and discuss it in a semi-lighthearted way, sometimes relating it to present events. For example, towards the end of last year, as the UK's withdrawal agreement from the EU came into effect, they considered our top 10 Brexits, 10 occasions when Britain cut herself off from mainland Europe beginning with the drowning of Doggerland beneath a tsunami around 6100 BC, which resulted in us becoming an island. And in the last couple of weeks, they carried out a World Cup of Gods. They didn't want to cause needless offence, so these were gods who at some point have stopped being worshipped. They weren't asking people to decide whether Krishna or Allah was best. No, they were mostly of the ancient variety. From Zeus to Ishtar, from Odin to the rather obscure Irish god Bridget. Prince Philip even got a mention as he was worshipped by a tribe in the southern island of Tanu in Vanuatu. So they did a draw like they do in football and people voted on whether Zeus was better than Odin or Ishtar better than Prince Philip. The loser was knocked out, the winner went on to the next round until there was only one left, which turned out to be Athena, the Olympian goddess of wisdom and war. These gods were a right mix of good and bad, from the manipulative to the downright nasty. They all needed to be kept on side, or else. And as I listened, it became very clear why, for most of human history, it was not considered good news when God showed up. It was far more likely that someone was in for it. And that goes for most of our Bible too. The most common opening line in an encounter with the divine is, don't be afraid. And with good reason. But it also shows why three little words which appear together twice in the reading this morning would have been so shocking when they were first uttered. God is love. So simple, so familiar to many of us, We may even have come just to take that for granted, really. But these are not only reckoned to be amongst the last words written in our Bible. They're written by an aging disciple who has spent a lifetime reflecting on the divine. God is love. We only realize it because of Jesus. When it comes to how humans see God, Jesus is a game changer. Note what John doesn't say. He doesn't say God has love, nor does he say God is loving, or even God is lovable. All of those things are true. But they're not what John says. God is love. Love is the very essence of God. As the passage is read, it's kind of hard to miss the point. In 15 verses, the word love appears no fewer than 27 times. Love is the driving force of everything God does. 
from creation to free will to providence and care to God's redemptive plans and purposes to reconcile all things to himself. Love is the basis of the whole law. Throughout history, since we were conscious of anything beyond ourselves, humans have wrestled with ideas of what God is like. The world is full of so much beauty, but so much terror. We have sought to explain it. So the dominant images of what God must be like fall broadly into a couple of different categories. For many, God is the angry judge, watching our every move, ever ready and willing to punish any slip up. The alternative is an aloof, disinterested God. One who creates the world and winds it up, but actually plays no role in it. It just takes the course it does. Or, says John, there's a third way. A God who created the world in love, sustains the world in love, and plans to redeem all things. God is love. Always there, always reaching out, always taking risks, never giving up. God is love simply because of who God is. God loves us just because. We're imperfect, we stumble, we can make a mess, and God goes on loving because God is love. The Beatles were kind of right. All we need is love. But what is love? How do we know it? This love that John speaks of, it's, it's more than sexual attraction. It's more than affection. It's more than loyalty. It's more than friendship and support. Love is utterly unconditional. When we dig into what John says here about love, we discover how our expressions of it are mere shadows of the kind of love John is talking about. That's not to dismiss them or to say they're no good. They are. We are truly blessed when we experience love. But they can't compare to the love John is talking about here. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. Think about it for a moment. Can we truly say that our loves are without fear? Love, as we so often experience it, makes us vulnerable. We put ourselves in the hands of another without any control over how they might respond. In love, we can fear loss, betrayal, that the one whom we give our love will ultimately not prove worthy of the trust. But none of those things is true of God's love. God loves us with an all-consuming love, which never runs out and from which nothing not even death can separate us. Love can't be proved. It can only be given and received, expressed and experienced. When it comes to love, actions speak louder than words. It needs to be shown. And God has shown his love in sending Jesus into the world to give us life, to draw the world back to God. For so many, even the God expressed in Jesus can seem like the angry judge, just waiting to punish. For many, the good news is that God is mad with us and needs to take it out on someone, but Jesus steps in and makes it all okay. For far too many, what passes as good news is that Jesus saves us from God. And nothing could be farther from the truth. 
The initiative to save us starts with God. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn us but to save us. God's every intention and longing for us is to live in his love. God didn't sent Jesus to reconcile himself to us, but so that we could be reconciled to him. There has never been a time when you were not forgiven. But you have a choice whether to live in that forgiveness. It's not God who needs the cross. It's us. Because somehow without it, we will never grasp that whoever we are, whatever we've done, we are forgiven, we are loved, we can come home. Because God is love. It's a well-known Bible verse that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But when you study anything, your aim is not to end at the beginning. You don't just want Wisdom 101. That'll only get you so far. The mark of growing in wisdom, the mark of drawing closer and closer to God is becoming more and more aware of his love. And the more we love God, the the less we will fear him. The more we fear God, the less we truly understand that love. Fear belongs to a situation where there is no trust and someone might use their power almost destructively. And it is true that God is all powerful. But God's power would rather go to the cross than destroy us and condemn us. And love builds trust. As trust increases, fear decreases. As fear decreases, so it makes more room for love to grow. The more aware we are of how much we are loved, the less we need to live in fear. We can be confident that we are safe in God's hands. And with him, we're going to be okay. But we don't just stop there. We aren't called to be mere containers of God's love. We're called to be channels of it. Whoever loves is a child of God and knows God. That phrase, child of God, it's a Jewish idiom which expressed ca character traits, really. We sometimes talk of people being a chip off the old block. And what we mean is that they bear some kind of family likeness. People might say, oh, I can tell whose daughter you are by something you've done. Sometimes in our house when we're watching the tennis, we say sometimes that around 2035, 20, 2040, 20, the Federer household with their twin girls and twin boys will have Wimbledon sewn up. Both singles, both same-sex doubles and the mixed doubles. If they take after their parents. When parents are good at something, they often pass that gift on to their children. Well, when God is at work in us, so the God who is love starts to find his love flowing, not just to us, but from us. The true test of just how much we know God is, not how much Bible we can quote, not how many conferences we attend, not how many nights a week we're at church stuff, not how many hours we've spent in prayer. It's whether we love. There is little in life that I find as sad as someone using the Bible as a weapon to attack, to win, 
to get one over on someone else. Jesus said, by this, others will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. Maybe it was that saying that John had in mind as he wrote, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. I love how the message puts that verse in. The person who refuses to love does not know the first thing about God because God is love. Or verse 16, God is love. When we take up a permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house. No one can see God, but they can see us. And they can see how we react towards them and each other. It's through us that God expresses his love. That's what it means for his love to be made complete in us. And this love, it's not just something we can conjure up within ourselves. Oh, in our better moments, we can be quite loving and on top form. But then there are the times when busyness or tiredness takes over. Or when someone is simply awkward and we find it hard to love them. And you know, it's not always without reason. No, this love we're talking about, it needs to be rooted in God. As the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it's like she creates a pipeline for the love of God to flow into us and through us to those whom we encounter. We live in a world which doesn't know just how loved it is. In part, that's because they've not seen it expressed in those who claim to follow him. And in large measure, that is because we have no idea just how much we are loved by God. I've talked a lot in the last few weeks about growing back better. And at root, that's a question of what is love asking of us next? In Christian terms, we have often talked about who's in, who's out. Maybe a different question is about the direction in which we are traveling it's maybe a better question are we drawing closer and closer to god or are we drifting from him are we being drawn deeper into love or are we drawing back from it whether we truly grow back better will depend on whether we let love have the rule of the house And that means within us and amongst us. Will we allow the story in which we live to be one in which our God is love? Will we be drawn deeper into that love? Will we allow that love to banish fear and turn freeing up space to allow further love to grow? Oh, may we do so. And may that love make its home in us, flowing from us, so that others will see that love, know that they are loved, and step into that love for themselves, because they have come to know God for themselves and discover for themselves that God is love. Grace and peace be with you. Amen.